Hello and welcome to this Deakin University alumni webinar with presenters Dr Jasmine Zeng, Dr Rachel Laws and an introduction from Professor Karen Campbell. Sam Johnson here from the Deakin Alumni Relations team. It's great to have you with us. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which we're broadcasting today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and to pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Today we're broadcasting from the Burwood campus and our webinar topic is Getting It Right From The Start, Childhood Nutrition and Obesity Prevention. Now to introduce our presenters and to frame today's discussion, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Karen Campbell from Deakin's Institute for Physical Activity and Nutrition. Over to you, Karen. Thanks, Sam. So as Sam said, I'm Karen Campbell. I'm the Professor of Population Nutrition within the Institute for Physical Activity and Nutrition. And I have the great pleasure of heading up a team of stellar researchers in the, a stream called the Nutrition in Pregnancy, Early Years and Childhood Research Stream. Um, you can see our pictures along the bottom here. And I guess I'm very proud of the fact that many of these fabulous researchers are homegrown within the Institute. So I wanted today to take a little bit of time just to frame the kind of research we do within our stream and to highlight, I guess, by the circular notion, the fact that we work across epidemiology, which means um, describing behaviours and, in this case, the dietary predictors of health across life. We're particularly interested, as you can tell from our photo, with mums and bubs and also partners. Um, we take what we learn from this, these epidemiological studies of large populations and fold that and lots of other stuff that we've learned from around the world into world-class co-built trials. So we design interventions that we um, will use with mums and bubs and families and trial those across um, particularly the Victorian context. We then have the opportunity, um, which is not common amongst researchers, to take what we learn from our randomised control trial interventions and to scale them up into statewide translation and implementation. So at the moment, we're rolling the infant program out across Victoria, and Rachel Laws will talk about that further. And as you can tell, the fourth quadrant in this circle is communication. As you can tell by doing webinars and many other things, we're very keen that the people who are interested in the work we do get the opportunity to hear about it. So it's my great pleasure to introduce two of our stars within IPAN. Firstly, uh, Jasmine Singh, who's a, um, an accredited practicing dietitian. She's also a nutrition epidemiologist. She does crunches the numbers to help us understand better um, what it is around behaviours in early life and diet in early life that's going to predict health across life. And also Dr Rachel Laws, another uh, practicing dietitian, a, one of our senior lecturers within the School of Exercise and Nutrition Science, and a great talent in helping us work to design trials and to translate them into community. So firstly today we're talking with Jasmine, so I'll hand over to Dr Jasmine Z. Hello everyone, I'm Jasmine, and Rachel and I are very delighted to be here today to talk about childhood nutrition and obesity prevention. And this is the overview of our talk today. So I will start off by providing some background on obesity and early nutrition and present some recent findings from a Victorian cohort. And I will then highlight guidance, some guidance and recommendations towards um, the best practice infant feeding. And Rachel will then give an outline on some um, evidence-based practical programs and resources available for parents and health professionals to support healthy infant feeding and active play. And she will then wrap up by providing you with more information and references. So some background on overweight obesity in Australia. So high and rising prevalence of overweight obesity is one of the main um, greatest public health concerns in Australia. And the recent estimates from the Australian Health Survey indicates that um, in 2017 um, and 2018, that 25%, almost one in every four children or adolescents were overweight or obese. And the figures were more alarming in adults that 67%, uh, almost two thirds of the adult population were overweight and obese. And obesity is a major risk factor for a range of adverse health outcomes, including cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and even certain cancer, etc. Um, understanding the um, early origins of obesity is imperative for obesity prevention, as obesity risk begins from infancy and it tracks through life course. And, and children with overweight and obesity, they are more likely to be obese, overweight and obese in adulthood. 
and extensive evidence suggests that rapid growth during infancy is a potent risk factor for obesity later in life. So our recently published systematic review, we tried to summarize the literature on infant rapid weight gain, defined as crossing a centile line in a weight growth charts. So this is what a weight growth chart looks like with all the centile lines and the association with overweight obesity later in life. And a summary synthesis from 17 eligible studies we found a 3.7 times more likely to be overweight and obese in later life. And further analysis looking at early rapid period of rapid weight gain from birth to one year has predicted even higher risk of overweight, subsequent overweight and obesity. And nutrition in early life determines growth and influences later obesity and health outcomes. Infant feeding practices, um, including um, breastfeeding uh, versus formula feeding, has shown protective effect on growth and adiposity. In contrast, early introduction of solid foods has been associated with higher obesity risk. And early dietary intake, such as macronutrient, is also important and has significant impact on growth and body weight status across life. And there has been a huge debate around um, protein intake during infancy and early childhood in promoting rapid growth in um, obesity. And in particular, the high protein content in um, formula compared to breast milk has been much debated. Furthermore, um, intake of specific foods such as sugary drinks and energy dense and nutrient poor foods has also been associated with obesity. And given that um, dietary behaviors and food preferences are established early in life, infancy and early childhood provides a unique and sensitive period for obesity prevention. So now I'd like to share some of the recent findings we found from a Victorian cohort called the Inf Melbourne Infant Study. Um, consisting of about 500 children with follow-up until five years of age. And Rachel will talk about the infant study itself later on. So by using the infant data, we address two main research questions. So the first one is to look at infant feeding, including breastfeeding duration and the timing of solid introduction, how these two factors influences the body weight trajectories from birth to five years in early childhood. And given the hot um, debate around protein intake during infancy, we also examine the association between total protein intake, protein sources during infancy, and how it relates to body weight status at five years of age in early childhood. And in both, in both analysis, we use both, we look at body mass index Z scores. So BMI Z score is a measure of um, weight status accounted for age and sex, and is widely used in monitoring growth and body weight development in children. So these slides here are showing you the relationship between breastfeeding duration and growth trajectories in early childhood. Um, so we divided the sample into two groups by breastfeeding duration, um, shorter than six months versus um, six months or more. So the graph showing here are the trajectories, the BMI trajectories from birth to 60 months, so five years by the breastfeeding duration groups. And the trajectory curve are plotted from a model where we adjusted for a, a range of child and maternal factors that are associated with body weight development. So they are child birth weight, child sex, gestational age, and maternal um, country of birth, maternal education level, so as a proxy for socioeconomic status, and also mother's pre-pregnancy and body weight status. So from the graph, this graph, here we can see the dotted line with triangle markers that represent the growth trajectory, so BMI Z score of children who started who were breastfed for shorter than six months. And the the flag solid lines represents tra um, BMI trajectories of children who were breastfed for six months or more. So we can see there are no difference in BMI Z score at birth between the two groups. However, interestingly, we found from three months to all ages to 60 months, children who were breastfed for six months more indicated by the black lines, they had a significantly lower BMI Z score than children who were breastfed shorter than six months of age. And the gap between the two groups is particularly evident at six months of age. So we 
um, conclude that the, um, there's long-term protective effects of breastfeeding on overweight and obesity extend to five years of age, and it's independent of childbirth weight, um, mother's country of birth, educational level, and also the pre-pregnancy body weight status. So these provide further support for infant feeding guidelines to promote breastfeeding for six months or more. And this slide here is showing us the results which, um, of timing of soil introduction and growth trajectories in early childhood. And similarly, we also divided the group into um, two groups by the timing of soil introduction before six months versus at or after six months. So, and the dotted line with triangle markers are showing the BMI sesco trajectories from birth to 16 months of children who started solid before six months. And the black lines here are showing the BMI ZESCO trajectories of children who started solid at or later than six months. And surprisingly, we found children who started solid before six months, they had a higher BMI ZESCO at birth. So that means children who are heavier at birth, they're more likely to introduce solid earlier before six months. So what does that mean? Does that mean large babies are more hungry? So it is likely that um, heavier babies, they're more likely to show an early sign of breathlessness. But however, further evidence are required to test this. And when we look at the BMI um, trajectories between the two groups from three months to 60 months, we found there's no difference between the two groups. In particular, there's no difference found in BMI ZESCO at six months of age. So this is, um, this is consistent with the current body of evidence regarding timing of soil introduction and obese risk. So there's no evidence of association showing that introduction before six months with higher obesity risk. However, there is some evidence showing that early introduction before four months and high obesity risk. However, um, testing the effect of early introduction before four months on those trajectories is not feasible in this sample because only 2% of the children, they introduce solid before four months of age. However, it would be val uh, valuable for future studies to examine this. So taken together with the findings from breastfeeding duration, we can conclude that the timing of solid introduction, whether before or after six months, was less important in predicting growth trajectories than breastfeeding duration. And we then looked specifically into protein intake and sources at nine months. And so we, for this sample, so we found the average total protein for this cohort is 28 grams per day. And it's all meeting the adequate intake for this sample of 14.4 grams per day. And when we look at the breakdown of protein intake by different sources, And we can see more than half came from plant and animal, indicated by the green and the yellow. And then the other half came from breast milk, formula, and dairy, and in which formula is the largest contributor, contributing about 24% of total protein intake. And we then conducted analysis to look at association between total protein intake and sources at nine months in relation to BMI Z score at five years of age. So these slides are showing you the um, association between total protein intake at nine months and BMI Tesco at five years of age. So we categorized the sample into four protein intake groups based on their intake distribution. So with mean intake of 16, 23, 30, and 41 grams per day respectively. And by looking at uh, using the highest intake category of 41 grams per day as reference category, and we're trying to see how do the, the rest of low intake protein categories associate with um, BMI score at five years. And the asterisk here be, um, indicates a significant difference between the reference category of the highest protein intake group and the comparison group. So we found um, the group with the lowest protein intake group with 16 grams of protein per day was associated with lower BMI Z score of 0.3 unit. However, this was not significant different. In contrast, the second and the third protein intake group with mean intake 23 and 30 grams respectively, they're all significantly associated with lower 
BMI test score at five years when compared to the highest protein intake group. And in particular, the second intake group of 23 grams was associated with the lowest BMI test score at five years. And we test for trend, there's no linear trends. So there was a U-shaped relationship between pro total protein intake and BMI test score at five years of age. And so that means neither too low nor too high is beneficial for child growth. So there was an optimal intake of total protein of 23 grams that's most beneficial for child growth. We then look at different protein sources and how it relates to PMI Z score at five years of age. And similar findings were found for animal protein, but not other protein sources. So we found the second intake group with um, three grams of protein intake was associated with lowest BMI score at five years of age. A U-shaped relationship was also revealed. So we found an optimal intake of total protein in animal protein intake for child growth, and the finding of this study is particularly valuable for uh, informing the establishment of nutrient reference values for optimal infant protein intake. However, because the infant sample have a higher proportion of the children, they have mothers or high, highly educated mothers. So further research in different study populations is needed to consolidate these findings. So after we've been through all the interesting findings from the real Victorian data now, we can link this back to guidelines and recommendations. So for breastfeeding, the Australian Infant Feeding Guidelines um, support, promote, and encourage exclusive breastfeeding to around six months of age and continue breastfeeding until 12 months of age and beyond. And any breastfeeding is beneficial for the child and the mother. And when a child is not receiving any breast milk, parents are advised to choose formula with the lowest amount of protein, closer to 1.3 grams per 100 ml, and to make sure we um, ensure correct preparation as per instructions by using the scoop provided in the right amount of water and also follow the baby's hunger cues and not the clock and try to phase out the bottles by 12 months of age into using a cup. And Rachel and our team uh, recently wrote a conversation article specifically about formula feeding entitled if you are feeding with formula here's what you can do to pro promote your baby's healthy growth so you can have a further read if you are interested. And for solar introduction, the infant feeding guidelines recommends introduction at around six months of age by introducing iron rich food first to prevent iron deficiency, such as iron fortified cereals and pureed meats and poultry, legumes and beans, and also avoid juice and sugary drinks and all foods with added sugar and also limit, limit nutrient poor and discretionary foods such as cakes and biscuits and potato chips and also feed your appetite and parents are there to provide and baby are there to decide how much to consume. And from 12 months of age, um, children are encouraged to have family meals consistent with the Australian dietary guidelines and choose the foods from the five core food groups showing here. So we can see there are the grains, vegetables, fruits, and meal and alternatives and meat and alternatives, and also avoid discretionary foods high in saturated fat, added sugar, added salt, and alcohol, which is down the corner here showing some examples. And the Australian dietary guidelines also provide sample daily food patterns for infants aged 7 to 12 months and also for toddlers 1 to 2 years. And they provide the recommended amount from each five food groups by providing the standard serves and also the number of servings per day. And just to be aware that the serve size for infants aged 7 to 12 months are smaller than those for toddlers 1 to 2 years. And then for children two years and over, Australian dietary guidelines also provide similar information on the recommended uh, amount from each five core food groups. And by providing the serves and then standard serves uh, based on your age and sex, and they, in addition, they also provide graphical examples of what constitutes a standard serve. And given our time, so I won't go through all the details here, but all the information here are available on the Australian Dietary Guideline website, and you can go online and check this out. And now I will hand over to Rachel to talk about 
um, practical programs. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jasmine. Um, it's a delight to be here to um, discuss some of the practical programs that we've developed here at the Institute for Physioactivity and Nutrition um, with the team, and to really, I guess, um, showcase to you how we've translated some of this research around nutrition and epidemiology into kind of practical programs to support parents, and it's fantastic that we've got so many parents online here today, and hopefully um, you'll be able to take away something from this session around our practical programs. So I firstly wanted to go through a program called the Infant Program, which Jasmine has already alluded to, um, and was developed by Karen Campbell, and um, who you've just met, and Associate Professor Kylie Hesketh. So Karen has obviously an interest in nutrition, Kylie has an interest in active play um, in young children, and together they conceived um, this program, which really aimed to improve both child and um, maternal diet, um, physical activity and sedentary behaviours, and there was a real focus on increasing fruit and vegetables and, and water and reducing some of those discretionary foods which Jasmine has just been talking about. So it was a program that was developed to be delivered through um, first-time parent groups um, here in Victoria. So all the parents um, online may remember going to a first-time parent group with your first child. So the program was actually delivered through those groups over the first 18 months of life. So it started when parents, um, when babies were three months of age, it went up to 18 months of age, and there were essentially six group sessions. Um, sessions ran for an hour to an hour and a half, and they were really a facilitated um, group discussion, both providing some information to parents um, in an anticipatory guidance way, which really means providing information before parents actually need it, with a lot of group discussion around how parents could practically um, implement some of these recommendations with, with their babies. So um, Karen and Kylie actually ran a randomised controlled trial to test the effectiveness of this program in, in 14 LTAs. And I just wanted to give you an overview of some of the results of the program and then tell you a little bit about how we're um, implementing the program going forward. So the RCT involved um, just over 500 um, mother and child pairs. Um, and I'll tell you the results of those in, in a moment, but just to reflect on, on some of the key messages that were coming out of the infant program. So um, you can see the, the messages on, on your screen there. So they were um, around um, a focus on, on fruit and vegetables, both in, in snacks and, and in meals, but also around tapping into water, um, role modelling, around eating together and, and playing together, and also an important message around parents provide um, babies decide or children decide and, and Jasmine talked about that briefly. So that's really around um, parents' responsibility is to provide uh, regular healthy um, meals and snacks and it's really up to babies or children to decide if and how much they'll eat and all the parents online will know that um, the kids are very good in deciding if and how much they eat um, but us parents are probably less good at uh, letting, letting our kids decide. So um, take the pressure off and, um, and leave it up to your children to decide even how much they eat. They're very good regulators of, of their own appetite. And another really key message coming out of the infant program was the off and running. So that refers to switching off your screens, um, your TV, and getting your children um, physically active, um, ideally outside. So that was kind of the key messages that were um, reiterated through those six sessions that parents attended. So just looking at some of the outcomes from the randomised control trial, so starting with the outcomes for the mums. So um, firstly, mums told us that they really liked the program, so we had over 70% attend more than um, four of those six sessions over that 15-month um, period. And also parents told us that they found it um, useful and indeed we saw improvements in, in parents' knowledge, their confidence, we saw changes in the feeding practices in, in a positive way. And really interestingly, we also saw changes in, um, in mum's dietary patterns. So even though the program typically wasn't focusing on what mums were eating, we actually did see improvements in, in um, maternal dietary patterns. So this really indicates that mums were really role modelling some of those positive messages to, to their babies. Looking at the child outcomes, this is at 18 months, so uh, we found that children watched around 25% less television than those in the control group. Um, we also saw about 25% fewer sweet snacks being consumed and overall improvement in the diet quality of the children at 18 months. We also saw in some subgroups, so particularly in younger, less educated mums, um, that their children were also drinking more water and eating more vegetables, which was really encouraging. 
However, we didn't see any impact on, on child growth and we expect that we probably need actually much larger numbers in order to see that kind of impact on, on growth trajectories. What was really encouraging was that these children were also followed up until they were three and a half and five years and we were able to see that some of those positive outcomes were sustained. Um, in particular, that children continued to consume fewer sweet snacks in, in the group that got the program. They also consumed more water at three and a half years and really importantly, consumed less sugar sweetened beverages at five years, which is fantastic given that it's such a low dose program. Um, and five years later, we're still seeing some of those behavioural outcomes being maintained. And they also viewed less TV at five years, which approached statistical significance. And as you would expect, if we didn't see any change in growth at, at 18 months, we also didn't see any differences in growth trajectory at those later years as well. So what's happened to the program since then? So the RCT, I think, was about 10 years ago. Um, and since then, we've had some opportunities to implement the program in the real world um, as part of the Healthy Together Victoria initiative, which some of you uh, may be familiar with, which ran a few years ago. So there were a number of communities that received special health promotion funding. So the program was made available to those communities as a healthy living program. And we did see that eight of those 12 communities did take up the program and started running it in the communities, which was fantastic. And since then, we've actually secured some funding to look at a statewide rollout of the program, which is really exciting. And that's through a NHMRC partnership grant. And you can see the list of wonderful investigators um, down the bottom. And essentially, we've got funding to evaluate the implementation of this program um, across the state of Victoria. And we're really excited to have um, 10 practice and policy partners on board, which you can see on the screen there, including um, the Victoria Department of Education and Training, um, the Department of Health and Human Services, and also um, about show. So we're looking at developing an Aboriginal um, tailored resource as part of this program as well. So what next with the rollout of the infra program? So basically we've been working very hard over the past six months to develop up some of the systems to roll out the program across the state. And essentially it'll be made available to local government areas next year. And we're developing an online training program for facilitators who are interested in, in delivering the program. And we'll be supporting them through our communities of, of practice. And the program will then be rolled out and delivered in local government areas that choose to, to take it up. And our role as researchers is really to understand how the program is being implemented. So who are we actually reaching? Um, what is the adoption and uptake like at the local government area? Um, how is it being implemented? And importantly, um, what will be the effect of the program on, on parent and child outcomes after five years? And of course, we're very interested in, in feeding back those learnings back into further improving the program. I also wanted to talk to you about a, another related program called My Baby Now, which is an app and website that we've been working on over the last um, five years or so now. And the team of people involved in, in developing that, you can see on the screen, but we've got a, um, a strong team of people, including Professor Elizabeth Jenny Wilson from University of Sydney and a group of us here at Deakin and other universities involved in developing that program. So essentially it is an app and website resource that will provide um, a key source of support for um, the face-to-face -face program that's being delivered through Infant. And the app is based on an extensive formative testing of a previous version of the app called Growing Healthy, where we had input from about 300 parents and a whole host of maternal and child health nurses, which was fantastic. Um, we have Raising Children's Network as key content partners in, in the app as well. And the aim is to have the app available um, across all devices and tablets and desktops, so there'll be universal access to, to the program. And we're looking to make the program available to those who are participating in the infant rollout starting next year. I wanted to give you a bit of a tour of what was actually included in the, in the My Baby Now app. So um, just in terms of what the focus of the app is, it does focus um, on, I guess, all of the um, components of the infant program, but it does include a focus on breastfeeding. And if breastfeeding is not possible, it also includes a focus on best practice formula feeding. Um, there's content around introduction of solids, healthy infant feeding practices, there's information on recipes, 
um, limiting exposure to non-core food and drinks, and there's also a section on, on play and, and pregnancy. So importantly, this program actually starts in, in pregnancy, so we can really support parents with those early stages of, of feeding, in particular breastfeeding. So just to take you on a quick tour of the app, so there's a My Baby section, which is really like a news feed or an update section where parents will get uh, push notifications. So we're sending three push notifications a week, and these are tailored to um, both your baby's age, but also their stage of development. So we're hoping to send you messages that are just right for the sorts of things that you're considering at, at the time. And you can see there's some feedback from one of our um, pilot participants, and they told us that, you know, the yeah, app's just so accessible, it's right there on your phone, and you're thinking, what shall I do? And you've got the information right there. So that's the aim, is to, to give you that information as you need it. So there's a whole series of topics within the app, and within each topic there's a series of articles, which hopefully will be of interest to, to parents. So within the articles we've got text information, we've also got lots of videos, and pictures to make the information accessible to, to a wide range of audiences. We also have a tools or an activity section of the app, and these are um, quizzes that you can do to get immediate feedback on um, aspects of feeding. So for example, is your baby ready for solids? If you're not sure about that, you can do the quiz, you'll get some immediate feedback on that, and you can actually click on some of that feedback and to look into the other sections of, of the app. So where to from here? So as I mentioned, the IMPRA program will be made, made available to all GL, LGAs across Victoria in the, starting next year. And the My Baby Now app will be offered to, um, to people who are participating in the IMPRA program. We'll be evaluating the effectiveness of that, um, those programs over the next five years. And we'll also, as I mentioned, be working with Bunchho um, to develop a program of work to develop and adapt resources specific to Aboriginal families. If you are working in an LGA and you're potentially interested in facilitating the input program, um, Karen would love to hear from you, and we've got your, um, Karen's email address there, so please get in contact with Karen if you'd like more information about the infant program, um, particularly if you're interested in being a facilitator. And also we're at the stage with the My Baby Now app where we're actually doing some technical testing of the app, so if you're a parent and you'd love to have a look at the My Baby Now app and you're happy to do a bit of testing for us and give us some feedback, then please get in contact with myself. Um, I've got my email address there and we'd love to have your help with that. The last um, practical program that I wanted to um, tell people about was the free online course that we have for parents and health professionals. And this is a future learn course called Infant Nutrition. And as the title suggests, it's really um, from breastfeeding right through to baby's first solids and, and family food, so that first year of life. Um, so this was developed by Karen Campbell. Um, we've had input from another a number of researchers and experts in infant nutrition here at the Institute. And the next course is running um, on the 29th of July, so completely free. If you Google uh, Future Learn and Infant Nutrition, you'll be able to find that course. And you'll see that we've had several thousand people actually complete the course over the past couple of years. So if this is an area that you'd like to do a deeper dive on, then please join us for the next course on the 29th of July. So that's the end of all of the, the content. I just wanted to alert people that there, if, if you're interested in more of the academic publications, there's a list of um, related references, both from um, Jasmine's work, but also from the Infant Program and from um, the Growing Healthy and the My Baby Now. Um, program at work, so um, please feel free to have a look at any of those references and of course um, get in contact with us if you have more information or questions. And now we're going to move into our question time. We will. Thank you so much for such an insightful presentation, Jasmine, Rachel and Karen. I um, appreciate all of you being here. We'll squeeze in. Um, squeeze around the microphone. So I've had a look at the results from the poll that we put up at the start and we've got a significant majority of health professionals joining us today. Uh, more than, uh, much more than 50%, but there's some parents and um, students and local government representatives too. So thank you all um, for joining us during your lunch hour, and um, it's great to have you with us. So now's the time to um, write any of the questions you have for um, our presenters into your question box and then hit submit. Um, we've got a few who, that have come through already, so um, we'll just get through as many as we can. Um, to start with, Jasmine, I think this refers to the, um, your section at the start. Um, Marita has asked if you refer to solely breastfed 
or receiving any breast milk. And I imagine that might be the difference you were talking about between breastfeeding versus um, formula. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm trying to say that breastfeeding has strong protective effect compared to formula feeding. And would that be um, if they're receiving any of it or most? Yes, so actually breast any breastfeeding is beneficial. Yeah. And when all the analysis that we have done included people that they have any breastfeeding, so to measure exclusive breastfeeding is quite hard. So in all analysis, so we included every, uh, anyone who had any breastfeeding. Yeah. Right. Uh, now I'll just I can squeeze across a bit. You can squeeze it a bit more, Karen, if you like. <laughs> we're bit, we're getting very cosy here. So um, next question we've got comes from uh, Colleen, who asks. What should parents be looking for in protein levels of formula? Is it less than 1.2 grams per 100 ml? Sure. So in, in Australia, um, the regulations around protein levels of formula are somewhere between 1.2 and 2 grams per 100 ml. So what we're suggesting is that parents choose protein levels at the lower end of that range. So we know breast milk has around 1 to 1.1 grams per 100 ml. So we're suggesting that if you choose to the lower end of the 1.2 to 2 grams per 100 ml range, then you'll get a closer match to, to breastfeeding. Great. We've got a couple of questions about the My Baby Now app. Um, firstly, um, Karen, could you just repeat the email address to email if people want more information? Um, so Sorry, Rachel. No problem. <laughs> so if you're interested in helping us test the My Baby Now app, um, my email address at r.laws at deacon.edu.au, the one that's on the screen on the left hand side, if you email me, then I can send you the information. We'd love your help with testing. And uh, Chelsea was interested to know what ages of the child the app is targeted at. Great question. So it's right through from um, pregnancy, so um, early gestation through to 12 months of age. It's a question from Ella here, who works in homelessness. She asks, any tips on how to promote healthy nutrition for families who cannot afford much? Well, that's a really great question. Um, and of course, there's all sorts of barriers around buying and preparing and affording and keeping food. I guess, at the start, a really nice thing to be able to do is to breastfeed, because breastfeed, um, breastfeeding is cheap. It's cheaper than formula feeding, and in fact, you need very few additional nutrients, surprisingly, to be able to breastfeed successfully and still remain healthy yourself. You know, also breastfeeding confers some health benefits on the mother as well as the baby. Um, I guess beyond that, I, I mean, I haven't, I haven't given this deep thought, uh, but I, it, it's an area that's really important uh, to consider, and I think I would be considering very carefully the, the services that are around to support people who are struggling um, in finding a home, in, in finding finances to support their health, it makes the choice of food even more important because if you've got a few dollars, choosing things that are going to be easy, accessible but healthy is very important and that's much harder done than said, I suspect. Um, now I've got to, I'll just push this one back a bit and see if I can see you all better. There we go, it's in the middle now so we can just squeeze in when we're answering a question. So a question from myself um, as the, the parent of a somewhat fussy young toddler, fussy eater. Um, for us parents out there, do you have any recommendations um, for fussy eaters, do's and don'ts? So talking about slightly older children, I suspect. So uh, I know your yeah, baby's um, 19 months yes. old. So yes, children are become less and less malleable as they get older. I have 25 and 27 year olds, so I'm well equipped to talk about this. Um, I think there's, it's a big topic, there's quite a lot to talk about. I think the MOOC, and the, the Future Learning MOOC is a good place to, to get more detail on that. But I guess some basic principles relate to very much the psychology of feeding children. So a line I think of myself is that the more you play ball, with whatever they're throwing at you, the more they'll keep playing. So by that I mean, if your children become increasingly fussy and resist the food that you're having, the more that you respond to that, the more you change the food you're offering, the more you go and get something else that you know they like, the more they are likely to keep doing that behaviour. So the notion of parents provide children decide is quite a nice one that Rachel has talked about, a nice behavioural approach. And that says, and I'm repeating what Rachel has told us already, but as a parent you have the opportunity to provide healthy food at regular intervals, so predictable intervals, that's your job done. The baby's uh, opportunity is to eat it or not, and they might throw it on the ground and, and cry and want to eat it. They will become hungry and they're not in great distress at this time, they're using their new manipulative skills. Um, 
They let them decide whether they eat or not. Let them decide how much they eat. The more you engage, the more you play ball, the more it becomes a little bit of a competition and a game. So as hard as it is to do, stepping back, letting your child decide what to eat and how much to eat is important. And what to eat is really decided by you. You put it out. I think baby-led weaning, which we haven't talked about, so not baby-linguini, but mm. baby-led weaning, um, I think can be particularly useful here. It's a, a whole other topic. Again, we cover it off well on the Future Learn um, MOOC. But that's really saying once food's in front of the baby, resist the temptation to feed it to them yourself. Let them take control and eat it themselves. Yeah. I'd be ready for some messiness, but it's all part of it, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Eating outside is good. <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, we had a question from um, Ali, who is um, soon to graduate, interested to know who the facilitator training, sorry, facilitator training is open to for the infant program. Do you want to answer that? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're having a bit of a guess, aren't we? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I guess at the moment we're um, we're really targeting maternal and child health nurses, um, but certainly within local government areas we have had parenting support workers run it, we have had health promotion officers run it, we have had dietitians run it. So I guess we're not wanting to limit it down to a particular health professional type, but I guess we're trying to test what different models of delivering the program might look like. So we're really open to other health professionals potentially running it and obviously it's provided with um, you know a whole lot of training to support facilitators in, in delivering the program and I, I guess what's come out of our early um, evaluation of, of the rollout in, in other local government areas if people feel comfortable in delivering parenting programs generally they're, they're generally comfortable after the training to deliver this type of program so hopefully that gives you a bit of a sense of uh, we're, we're fairly open to yeah I think one advisor at the moment, given that this is a community trial and our interest is to uh, promote healthy eating and, and active play knowledge and skills to everybody, not just to people who can afford it, is that this is something that will be offered um, really free through communities. So local government areas may pay a small amount for the training, but at the end of the day, the delivery of the program will be free. And is the program confined to Victoria at the moment, and do you look to... Well, yes, at the moment it is, but the grant that we've got from the National Health Medical Research Council has included um, nutritionists and dietitians from all jurisdictions around Australia. So I guess what I would say is that we're hopeful that any of the lessons that we learn, and this is unusual kind of research, the translation research, may be useful in other states and territories. So there's a lot of people watching this space at the moment. I think it's just, it's just universally been acknowledged that what we do in these pregnancy, first days of life, first years of life, is fundamentally important to health across the rest of your life. So let's work hard to get it right. Another question from Ella came in. She asks, do you know or think that there's a correlation between children choosing not to eat foods because they're intolerant or allergic and maybe it causes them pain? Anyone want to tackle that one? I'm happy to have that's a, a really good question, Ella, and I, I think we, I can't, we can't answer that definitively one way or the other because it's a bit hard to know with children or without testing changes in their guts, how would we definitively know that? I think we probably shouldn't give too much credence to that because I think a lot of what's happening with fussy eating is behavioural manipulation on, on the child's part. Notwithstanding that, given that we have a well-acknowledged and quite large community of children who are on the autistic spectrum and some children with real other developmental delays, it is important to differentiate or break apart children, the mass of children who are just having a go with their parents and seeing how much weight they can pull. And children who have special needs um, and may indeed be much more sensitive to taste and to sound and to a whole range of things. So again, on our, um, our future learning course, we have a section on fussy eating generally, and we have one on extreme fussy eating you might like to have a look at that in the future. Um, we've got a little bit of time now, so I encourage anyone that's been, sorry about that, anyone that's been sitting on a question to please type it into the question box now and hit submit. Um, we've got yeah, a little bit of time left for some more questions and thank you to those who's already um, sent theirs through. I've got another one, um, which is again, sort of from my, my mind. So I'm just wondering if there are any um, resources the three of you recommend for um, recipes for you know young children that are sort of both popular with kids but also very healthy and that kind of thing. 
Well, if you if you want to help us test them on baby now, we have a whole recipe section in there which is specifically designed for family meals but can be adapted for babies and for toddlers. So there's nothing worse than kind of trying to think that you're going to cook different meals for um, for a toddler and then something else for the baby and then something else for the parents. So these recipes are really designed to, to cover off um, a whole host of options for feeding the whole family. So a very good reason to dive into the My Baby Now app and, and do some active research with us and, and help us to get it right. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things, some research I did a little bit in the past was looking at children's salt intake. And of course, we know that salt's not great for any of us. Um, salt intake in very young children, so children who are moving to the family meal, is actually extremely high. And so in thinking about meals that are healthy for kids, we would encourage family meals. Um, but the premise has to be that the family meal is a healthy meal. And so one of the things to be really conscious of is not adding salt to your cooking, also being aware of all the hidden salt that sneaks into your cooking. So for instance, choosing a lower salt stock if you're buying stock and not the regular stock, being aware that some breads are much salty than others, that some brekkie cereals are much saltier than others. So when we have children, they come in, they, they catastrophize our life. We're talking about this over lunch. Who would know how, how amazing it is to have a child and how much time they take up, but they will join you at your table, we hope. That's the best place for them to be eating is with you and your partner. Um, but it's a great time for you to start to model, model the healthy behaviours you know you should be embedding yourself and to be aware of you know, all the health messages that are good for you and going to be good for your baby. Great. And <clears throat> Karen, you were mentioning um, when we were discussing the needs of um, children with special needs, um, Lauren asks, what was the course that you said had information about feeding in children with special needs, e.g. Um, ASD? Uh, so that's a section called Extremely Fussy Eating, and that's within the Future Learn Massive Open Online course, which Rachel referred to. So if you want to do that course, it's free. It's run by us at Deakin, and it's run four times a year. The next start date is the 29th of July, I think we said. We've actually just finished one. Um, if you use Google Future Learn Infant Nutrition, you'll find it comes up and you can register, and you'll then get reminder emails to join as it starts. Great, thanks. Okay, there's um, a long question here from Tony, Tony so I'll read it out and um, see who would like to take that one. Regarding formula feeding, although we intend on breastfeeding, is it recommended to choose formula based on lower protein levels to avoid obesity? And he says, we are expecting a second child soon and our initial thoughts were to avoid one of the popular formula types just to avoid the no stock issue that we see at supermarkets. What are your thoughts? Yes, uh, I guess if you're intending to, to breastfeed, then um, I guess that's a, that's a fantastic in, intention to, to, to go with. Um, in terms of formula choice, yes. So choosing a formula with uh, the lowest amount of protein is, is what we're recommending. So um, have a look at the various options um, available in the supermarket. And there is an overwhelming number of options, but it does provide you with some guidance on, on which, one, um, which one to choose. Right, thanks. Um, Gail's written in a question or a comment saying it is interesting that the two key messages are around fruit and veg for in infant program when mothers often find these foods easy to offer as first foods but find meat and alternatives i.e. iron rich foods harder to know how to introduce. Any thoughts on that? Yeah look it's a, it's a great question. Um, do you want to jump in Jeff? Okay. Um, yeah, I think I think you're right. We're all pretty good at knowing how to um, to puree up some some fruit and vegetables. But thinking about how you actually get iron rich foods in is um, is really important. And the infant feeding guidelines do recommend the introduction of iron rich foods as as first foods. So I guess looking at iron fortified cereals is a good way to go. So um, often rice cereals, um, wheat bix can be quite high in iron um, as well. And you might also be, be thinking about um, including some pureed um, beef or lamb or other meats high in iron um, as part of baby's first foods as well. So that could be either done through some pureeing and mashing with other foods or it could also be done through some baby lead weaning approaches. So babies are quite good at even sucking on a piece of, of steak and, and getting quite a lot of nutrients out of that even if they're actually not able to, to chew it at that point in time. 
Can I add to that? So I think things like meat steak are actually quite good because it really is mostly just meat, whereas the foods, the, the meat foods we know are often offered are sausages and fish fingers, which actually are not very high in iron. And the reason, I mean, it is a great question, but the reason we promote iron is because iron is one of the limiting nutrients in children's diets in Australia and around the world. So it's just one to keep in mind. It's not one to become obsessive about, but it's one to keep in mind. Um, another question here from Ella, who's been great. Thank you, Ella. So um, when breastfeeding, how important is mum's nutrition? If mum isn't eating well, will that significantly impact the quality of their milk? And she's thinking again in the homelessness um, sort of situation. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it's again, a lovely question, Ella. Thank you. I mean, one of the interesting things with breastfeeding is that the quality of breast milk is maintained at a very high level even in extreme mal malnutrition so as we might see in developing economies so the the body preferentially will nourish the baby over the mother and i guess that's to do with you know adults can probably survive for a while being less well nourished a child definitely can't because they're in such rapid growth and development so None, not with, notwithstanding that, babies will do well. The mum's nutrition is incredibly important for their own health. It's one of the risks for women um, when they have babies is that they gain weight more rapidly than they would have done if they hadn't. And the heavier they get, the worse their own health outcomes will be over life. Very hard to lose weight once you gain it. So keeping an eye on your own weight when you, um, when you have babies is very important. And I guess one other comment is that the food that you eat as a mother, probably during pregnancy, but also uh, while you're breastfeeding, does convey flavours across to the amniotic fluid in the baby, when the baby's in utero, but also to the breast milk when the baby's breastfeeding. And there's um, new and emerging evidence that would suggest that mothers who, for instance, enjoy more fruits and vegetables, let's use vegetables in particular, because that's one of our most limiting foods, um, enjoy more vegetables when they're pregnant, and when they're breastfeeding, have children who will be more accepting of those foods when they're introduced. All right. Um, oh, we've got one last question here, and then I think we'll have to finish up. So um, Chelsea asks, do you take into consideration environmental sustainability eating for planetary health of diets and foods in your recommendations? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a, that's a really great point, Chelsea, and we're, we're hearing... I guess more and more with the Eat Lancet report that's come out earlier this year around um, the importance of not only um, eating for our health, but also eating for environmental sustainability and, and the planet. So I guess those recommendations are really suggesting a kind of flexitarian type approach to eating and where we're not, not just having a very meat-based diet, we're having much more of a vegetable-based diet and getting a lot of our proteins from, from vegetables. So if we translate that back to what we're introducing our babies to and thinking about introduction of, of solids, then legumes are a great source of, of iron. So thinking about where we can incorporate um, legumes and, and um, plant-based proteins, tofu, soy-based proteins into the diet is, is fantastic. So I'm thinking of some wonderful um, vegetable casseroles with legumes that you could introduce your babies to, which would um, also be great for the planet as well as for the whole family's health. And the budget, I imagine. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, that's great. That's all the time we have for questions. Um, thanks to everyone. Um, and please feel free to email through any questions you have um, after this to the email addresses you see on the screen. Um, and thanks to the, the three of you for your time today. It's been fantastic to have you. So Professor Karen Campbell, Dr Jasmine Zeng, and Dr Rachel Laws, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn the uh, webcam off for a second. There's a few more messages I've got for you from the Alumni Relations Office. Um, so just um, to let you know, please don't forget to follow us on social media. We've got Facebook and LinkedIn um, channels, and we'd love to have you um, connected with us. So as part of that, you'll hear about <clears throat> events that we're running and also great offers like this one, which is 15% um, of postgraduate course fees for Deakin alumni in immediate family. You can find more information about that on the Deakin alumni website. Another thing that we love to do for our alumni is provide some great uh, competition um, opportunities. So if you do um, provide us with your contact details or stay in touch via social media, you'll hear about some of these um, fantastic competitions and you can take away some great prizes like um, tickets to netball games or uh, movie vouchers and some travel vouchers as well. So please do keep in touch with us. 
So that's all we have time for today. Thank you again for joining us and thanks for all the questions. We hope you can join us for the next alumni webinar, which will be coming up soon. Have a great day.